Uh, there's obviously been a lot of very interesting people talking about a lot of very interesting things today. Uh, I'd like to take a minute and talk about a stick that I found in a hole in the ground. <laughs> but I think that that stick actually says something pretty profound about human curiosity. I map and explore caves, and most of the time, nobody's ever been in those spaces before. Uh, but in a cave in the Grand Canyon, a group of people and myself found that stick. Uh, a single split twig made to, you know, used to make figurines like these, placed deliberately in a crack in the wall of a cave 3,000 years ago by a person who scaled 200 feet to get into that space. Why would you do that? I mean, why would you risk your life to put a stick in a cave? Uh, standing there looking at that stick is actually a really good way to feel pretty small and ephemeral. But it also makes you think a lot about why you and that person and the group of people you're with all were so driven to this inaccessible place. I mean, why are humans so drawn to the unknown? These, these caves are fascinating places. There's actually thousands of miles of cliff face in the Grand Canyon. And in some of these cliffs, we've, we find these cave entrances that are millions of years old. They, they actually predate the canyon itself. And, and the only reason that we can even get into them is because millions of years ago, when the Colorado River downcut through the ground to form the Grand Canyon, it exposed these entrances to the surface. And, and we can see the entrances, but we have no idea what's in them. You, you can't fly an airplane over these spaces ahead of time. GPS doesn't work underground. The, the only way to know what's down there is to actually go in person. So a couple times a year, a group of people and myself uh, fly from all over the country and head out to the Grand Canyon under a research permit through the National Park Service. And we put everything we need for nine days on our backs. Tents, sleeping bags, rope, food, grappling hooks, pirate flags. Don't forget your pirate flag. <laughs> and, and we bushwhack down through thousands of, thousands of feet of cliff face, through yucca and agave and cat's claw and manzanita and all these great names for desert plants that are really just spiky and stabby and make you bleed. <laughs> just so we can camp in this wash that's overrun by fearless desert mice that will almost literally steal the food out of your mouth if you give them the chance. And after all that, we tie our ropes to giant rocks and rappel off a 600-foot cliff. Unlike the mice, we are not fearless. Mom, I know you're in the audience somewhere. Close your eyes. We call this an air bath, and even after all the time I've spent on rope, it's still terrifying. But it's the only way to get into these spaces, so if we want to map and explore these caves, we, we have to do this crazy vertical work to do it. Um, but once we're there, it like, gives us access. So how do you map a cave? Uh, again, can't fly an airplane over the space, GPS doesn't work. It's surprisingly old-fashioned. We actually take laser range finders, and, and we collect data point to point to point throughout the entire cave. Um, compass bearing, inclination, distance. And, and we do that because we don't know where the cave is going, and sometimes they're miles and miles. We have to do that for the entire space. That involves going down every hole on the floor, up every single hole in the ceiling, under rocks that look like they might have passage underneath, and into cracks in the walls that are so tight that sometimes you have to put one arm above your head like this and one on the side and kind of wiggle in until you can feel the rock on your chest and your back at the same time. And the only way to make forward progress is actually just to push with your toes. And most of the time, that goes nowhere. But every once in a while, it goes to some pretty cool stuff. Uh, like these giant underground rooms that, you know, again, nobody's ever been in these places before. Uh, or, or this, I mean, these are called gypsum flowers. They're actually an, an extrusion out of the rock pore that's caused by capillary action. You know, you can just be going through this space and just run into a room like this. Uh, these are ar aragonite chandeliers. Again, just a strange geological formation. I like this one. This is actually the cross-section or end of a stalagmite that's tipped over. And what you're looking at is actually the rings that formed as the precipitation that was filtering down into the cave changed over years and years and years. So it's a lot like tree rings, but each one of those rings represents way more time than a tree. So we take all this data and we record it. And, and again, it's surprisingly rudimentary. I mean, we're literally writing it down on pieces of paper. Th these are not old sheets of paper. This is just mud. Uh, and on the left is the data. 
and on the right is sort of a hand-drawn sketch, and we collect that data for, these, for all of these places and plug it into a piece of software called Compass that does a whole bunch of trigonometry for us, and we end up with this kind of rudimentary three-dimensional line plot of the cave. You can take that and combine it with that sketch to form this sort of finalized map. And, and this is a ton of work. I mean, some of these caves, it's, it's taken decades for people to create accurate maps of them. And there's cavers doing this all over the world, all the time. Why? <laughs> I'll tell you a quick story. I, I signed up to, for a pretty hard cave trip. A, a woman I, I know it was diving a sump at the bottom of a, a really cold cave. And so a sump is essentially just a water-filled section of passage that, that we were trying to see what was on the other side. And I signed up for this trip, and I'm telling a friend of mine that I'm going, a fellow caver, and he kind of gives me this sideways look. And I say, Andy, what's that look for? Are you telling me that I'm the only idiot stupid enough to do this? And without missing a beat, he looks at me and says, oh no, there'll be plenty of other idiots. <laughs> I mean, this story is sort of my confession, right? I, I, I wonder all the time if this is crazy. I mean, to structure so much of my life around something that's literally most people's nightmare, to, to crawl into these claustrophobic cracks, to, to hang on rope, to sleep underground for days at a time, you know, to just, just to produce this map. I mean, why would you do that? Why would that person 3,000 years ago scale that cliff just to put that stick in a crack? Each of those things in isolation seems pretty insignificant. You know, you're just mapping and exploring a little bit of cave. But when you add up those thousands and thousands of feet and, and those hours spent exploring, you get a map. And all of that has helped humans to, to, to better understand geology, for cavers to make discoveries in biology, uh, in, in the way that human circadian rhythms work in the absence of sunlight, the psychology of group dynamics and adverse conditions, all because somebody just wanted to see what was in a hole in the ground. It, it's a slow, slow accumulation of knowledge. And, and you know, it, it's certainly my contributions are pretty insignificant. But when you add all of that up, you start to see the difference between us, and I mean all of us, and that person 3,000 years ago. This is actually one of the photographers whose photos you're looking at today. Um, and, and I like this picture, because if you look at that camera, that camera is just like a cave map. I mean, yes, Nikon built that camera, but Nikon didn't figure out how to turn petroleum products into plastic. Nikon didn't develop the circuitry that's used to get those images off that camera onto your computer. Look at that rope. I, I trust my life to that rope all the time. I don't understand the details of how it's woven. I don't understand the way that the industrial machines that manufacture it work. But I put my faith in that collective knowledge. And, and I can guarantee you that when the chemist at DuPont that sat down to understand the molecular structure of nylon did so, he, he never imagined that this is how it would be used You know, as a, as a way to explore caves. The process is so collective, right? And it takes all of this time. When you see that stick underground, the reason it feels so profound is because it immediately compresses all of that time. That person is me. I mean, their urge is the same, just to explore the unknown. The difference is that I've been given this gift, and that gift is a thousand and thousands of years of collective human knowledge that all just came from people trying to follow their curiosity. That gift is, in a way, all of our collective inheritance. And if we lose that, we go back to just being a single individual, scaling an impossible cliff, hoping that history finds our extinguished torch. Th these things don't need to be scientific. I mean, to be involved in this process, you don't literally need to be filling in blank spots on a map. In a way, we're all doing it right now. I mean, this sharing and refining of information is so central to what TED is. When somebody first asked me to speak, I, I had a lot of doubts. I mean, what do I have to say that's important, that, that actually matters? But I, but I realized that in order to support this project, you had to, I had to engage in it, e even if it meant risking failure. The, f the first time somebody spoke at TED was actually 33 years ago. I had to look this up. And, and the amazing thing about that is if, if you go back and watch those early speeches, those people actually predict devices that we all now carry around in our pockets all because people followed that curiosity and, and tried to fill in those blank spots in human knowledge. 
one really big blank spot in caving is the deepest cave in America. We don't know where it is. We don't even know if it's been discovered yet because again, you can't fly an airplane over these places ahead of time. But the deepest known cave right now is a thousand miles from the Grand Canyon in Montana. And at the bottom of it, it just keeps going because so far human willpower has failed. I mean, we have to pack all our gear in on mules. Uh, you still the same thing. You're putting all this vertical gear on and going into these awful spaces, rigging all of these ropes, most of the passage looks like this. It's tight. It's freezing cold. It's not quite literally. It's 38 degrees, I believe. Uh, and, and at the bottom, you just end up sleeping in a pile of mud and eating freeze-dried food out of Ziploc bags. Everybody who has gone hates it. I mean, literally, they hate it. <laughs> and, and I wonder, why bother going back? I mean, why don't I just go sit on my, my couch and drink a beer? It's probably just a crack in the mud at the bottom, and yet I'm gonna go back. <laughs> you don't need to crawl down uh, you know, a crazy crack in the mud in order to be part of this process. Uh, human existence moves forward in a lot of different ways, but there's a couple of things you can do to help. I mean, if you see somebody engaging in something with a high risk of failure, don't judge that failure, support them. If you feel that curiosity in yourself to do something new or to try something new, even if you're not really sure why, don't be ashamed of that, follow it. And, and when you learn interesting things, share them. Because that's how we carry that collective inheritance forward. Even if we have to do it foot by foot, pushing with our toes. Thank you. Thank you.